Hello, I'm Irma Baker. Welcome to our show. We're sponsored by RSVP, the Retired Senior Volunteer Program, which is a part of Mature Services. We like to think of our show like a kaleidoscope, that we're focusing on interesting activities, organizations, and individuals in our viewing area. Well, right after these messages, we'll be back with today's guest. RSVP of Summit County has been making a difference in our community since 1972. RSVP volunteers are increasing the quality of life by participating in programs and organizations that provide important services to the community. RSVP matches personal interests and skills with opportunities to serve. If you're interested in adding more meaning to your life and improving the lives of others, please call 330-253 4597 extension 166. Welcome back. Our guest today is Jane Ann Terzillo. Jane is the author of Wicked Women of Northeast Ohio. Jane, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here and uh, to look at some of maybe the villainous history <laughs> of our area. Now, you're yes. writing in your book, Wicked Women of Northeast Ohio, you're writing about 10 very interesting women who we wouldn't want to live next door to. Uh, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How in the world did you come up with a topic like this? How did you get interested in these villainous women? Well, uh, one of my degrees is in criminal justice, and I was a police and fire reporter um, for um, a large weekly newspaper, which I was part owner of. And You're talking about the West Side, West Side Leader. Leader. Yes, and uh, then also a, a smaller paper. So um, I've and, I, and I've always enjoyed history. So in order to put these two together. Um, I was, I was kind of looking around. I had done two other books, and I was looking around for a new project, and so I thought, well, I'm going to go out there and see what, uh, uh, what's out there in the way of publishers. And I came up with uh, the History Press, who published Wicked Women. And um, so a couple of days later, and this is, this is funny, it's kind of serendipity, a couple of days later I got an email from the acquisitions editor at History Press and I had not contacted them but I just had been looking at them and so he had uh, read my Hudson book and wanted to do, know if I wanted to do a book for them and I said sure I'd love to um, so he said well shoot me some ideas so I didn't really have any ideas at the time just you know kind of like fuzzy ones in the back of my mind so I came up with um, um, oh the history of Akron Police Department, um, uh, Pioneer Women of the Western Reserve, and uh, Shady Ladies. And so he came back to me a couple of minutes later and he said, well, I like Shady Ladies, but let's, ma let's make it Wicked Women. So Wicked Women of Northeast Ohio was born. It was born just that quickly. Just and that suddenly quickly, yes, it you was. were faced with having to come up with the content for that yes. book. Yes. Mm -hmm. How did you choose the women? Um, well, I guess maybe they chose me uh, because they, they just, uh, you know, came at me at a time that I needed them. Um, I started going to the libraries in the area. The first library I went to was in Maslin. Um, and I would talk to the librarians and say, you know, this is what I'm doing. Um, do you know of any historical crime, you know, crimes that were committed by women in your area. Um, sometimes they didn't. So I would just sit down and start going through the newspapers. Sometimes they did and they would say, well, you know, there was this woman that um, killed her husband in, you know, where was that? And so they'd, go, they'd start going through the papers and they would find it. Um, librarians are the most wonderful people <laughs> in the world, I think. Um, because they would, you know, they would get interested in what I was doing. And so three or four of them that I worked with would be sitting right next to me going through papers. And I'd be going through other papers and they would find something and I would find something. And so that's pretty much how they came about. Each one came about in, you know, in a different way. Um, I might have been reading something 
somewhere else and and a name would come out a you know a woman that had done something and so I marked it down and I had a file that I was keeping of interesting things that I found in the newspapers and it's pretty much how they came about well tell us about some of the women who are in the book well my favorite two maybe I shouldn't say my favorite two because I, I really liked them all would be Akron Mary uh, her name was Mary Alice Chambers um, and she was married a couple of times she was and this was back um, during prohibition and she was a very beautiful young girl she went to Kenmore High School and by the time she was 15 she was married and uh, that didn't work out too well so then she apparently she came back home and she married um, a slide trombone player and um, no she married another man in between that's right another man in between and had a couple of kids with him and life was kind of boring maybe so she started you know stepping out on him then she got to the the slide trombone player well then she met uh, Pittsburgh Jaime Pittsburgh Jaime Martin and he was kind of a two-bit hood I guess you'd say he was a bootlegger and he ran liquor between Pittsburgh and Akron Youngstown I think up into Detroit Cleveland and down as far as Steubenville um, he was able to kind of show her um, you know nightlife and fun and excitement and you know he'd take her to speakeasies and um, to hear jazz and you know to dance and things like that and he had lots of money and he was all very you know, neatly dressed and everything um, and so I think she just kinda got enamored with that well she got into trouble when he brought her back over to Cleveland and uh, at the same time that they were in Cleveland or Akron and we're not really sure what happened um, a man by the name of uh, Raren Bill Potter who was uh, a Cleveland councilman was murdered and uh, the authorities felt that it was Pittsburgh Jaime who had murdered him so they collected him up and uh, then they couldn't find her so she went she went underground now whether she went underground of it being her own idea or whether it was his friends that kind of uh, secreted her away I, I don't know um, so she was kind of the gangsters mall she was the gangsters mall yes I get, although I don't know I think malls carried guns and stuff and I don't think she did I don't think she was violent at all but uh, the police wanted her because she would be a, um, a material witness as to whether where Pittsburgh Jaime was at the time of the murder but they spent um, a month trying to find her and they would get uh, uh, sightings of her someplace and so they had two police departments over two states and throughout all these counties looking for her um, they sat on uh, on her family's house you know watching when I say sat on the house I mean um, that they were you know surveilling it uh, they surveilled his friends places and uh, but finally they did find her and um, he was uh, he was convicted of the murder but later it was overturned um, well not overturned but it was um, uh, he was tried again and, and was um, let go he was found not guilty um, I think she had enough excitement by that time so she kind of fell out of uh, out of sight um, what was interesting and what is not in the book about Akron Mary was I was I was sitting at my desk one day uh, working in the phone rings and um, I picked it up and this gentleman said is this Jane Ann and I said yes it is and he said this is uh, so-and-so he said and I'm Akron Mary's grandson and huh. I had not looked for any of these women's descendants at all um, I really didn't want to know to know them <laughs> um, so anyhow he said um, he was quite pleased I guess with the way that I had portrayed her 
And come to find out, she had gone to Florida, uh, become a nurse, and she died down there. And um, she was kind of a, um, I guess a really good person at the end. He sent me a picture of her, a picture that I didn't have, that w I wish I'd had for the book that was, you know, really beautiful. But sometimes when you're, you're, you're researching these things, you never know who has what research. And so you just kind of, you know, do the best you can to find everything that's open to you at the time. Well, I'm glad to hear that Akron Mary wasn't, um, maybe because she's local to our viewing mm -hmm. area, that she wasn't uh, the most villainous of the women. She was more an accessory right. to villainy there. Right. But some of the women in your book really, uh, I would not want to be anywhere <laughs> near those women. Yeah, there women. were some of them that were, you know, quite vicious. Would you tell us a little bit about some of the others? Um, well, I'll tell you an, uh, another favorite is um, the Cleveland Madam, and her name was Ardell Quinn, and she was really um, a businesswoman, you would say. Now, it was Elliot Ness who put an end to her, but her reign as the queen of um, brothels, I guess you'd want to call it, I don't know, in Cleveland was like 20, 20 years. and. Um, she had, I believe, policemen on her payroll. Uh, she had, you know, the black book, but it turned out to be a, a blue book in the end. She had politicians uh, that it was a very, very classy, classy house. <coughs> and it was beautifully and uh, luxuriously decorated. She had chandeliers, she had oriental carpeting, she had oil paintings on the wall, marble on the walls, and you know, but upstairs were her ladies. Who just the, happened to be boarders <laughs> in the house. <laughs> yes, boarders oh. in the house, yes, <laughs> that's what, that's what she would tell the police anyway. <laughs> How did they bring her down? She uh, had, um, been talking, well, what happened was uh, they were looking for Alvin Carpus, who was a part of the Barker gang at the time. Now, Carpus had robbed um, a train. He had also uh, kidnapped a couple of very wealthy men, and so they were looking for him. Now, the authorities, or the G men as they were called at the time, they thought that a couple of Ardell's girls were girlfriends of his. So they raided her house. What they did was they tapped her phone to find out if they, if, you know, indeed Carpus was talking to a couple of these girls. They raided the house, and of course Carpus wasn't there, and um, so they arrested her for um, the Mann Act, which what it was, was the Mann Act was, it was also called the White Slave Act, and it was meant to stop uh, women from going across borders or taking women across uh, state borders for immoral purposes. Well, Ardell had been talking on the phone with a young lady in Texas and asking her to come and work for her. And she also said, well, do you know anybody else that might like to come and work for me? Well, as a matter of fact, this woman did. And uh, so she said they were in, um, was it Missouri, I think. And so this was, this is what they, they, they got her on, was this telephone conversation. Uh, she did a year in prison. She lost everything. She lost uh, the, the big house. She lost all her all her furniture, all her beautiful uh, uh, paintings and everything. What was kind of funny, I thought, was a lot of these high rollers that had been her, her customers, if you will, uh, owed her money and she couldn't collect from them. They, because she was in trouble and they, I, I suppose, they figured that they didn't need to pay her. 
Well, I would so imagine that they felt they'd uh, used her services as much as they were going to, and she was a lost cause and now. And that was it, yeah. So she did a year in prison. Uh, that was all. And um, then she died, um, I forget, I, th I, I want to say in the 70s, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Well, these two women, I mean, we've had Ardell, who is really a businesswoman, mm -hmm. as you said. Yes. Business may be immorality, but <laughs> it was a business that she handled there. And uh, Akron Mary, who was the uh, small-time mobster's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. But some of the women uh, in your book really were serious villains, serious criminals. I'm thinking of Jeanette McArdle in the book who really, um, not that it was ever specifically proved, mm -hmm. but uh, to all appearances killed her four brothers and sisters, Poison her mother, and, mother. and mother. tried to kill her father. Yes. Yeah, and she, the thing with her was that somebody would die after she came home. She was always in and out of the picture. She was, um, and where she, she would disappear for a period of time, and then she would come back, and sure enough, one of her brothers or sisters would die. It would probably have been poisoned, is, is what they think. Um, I had a manuscript from a woman who had been um, a seamstress in the house, and she said, and in, uh, in this manuscript, she said that um, she a had to share the room. In, in those days, and this was back in the 1830s, in those days, young women who did not, were not married uh, and were not living at home, they were either seams they became seamstresses or laundresses or teachers or something like that. And what they would do is they would go and stay in the homes of the people that they were working for. And this seamstress stayed in um, in their home, and she was in the same room with Jeanette. And she said that one night in the middle of the night, she couldn't sleep for some reason, and um, that Jeanette got up and checked her to see if she was sleeping, and she pretended that she was. She went into a, um, I guess it was like a, a a trunk or something and got out some men's clothing, put it on and left the room and came back sometime later. Um, and the next morning they found um, some things stolen. Um, there's, you know, there's more to it than that, but it was the one, one of the children had seen a man outside he had gotten up to I don't maybe go go to the bathroom or to get a drink or something like that happened to look outside and saw a man wandering around outside the house and well thought it was a man but it was probably Jeanette so and she uh, she wound her way through all the family until she finally killed her mother and or you know we suppose she killed her mother so it was never proved that no. she did that, but every time she came home from one of her absences, someone else in the family would died, die. and died rather violently. Yes, and what she would do is when the, when the family member would get sick, she would be the nurse. She would take care of them. Her mother um, came down with something, and she, you know, she took care of her mother and, and would feed her. And... Um, and that's kind of what happened, yeah. But it must be hard to do research. You said this goes back to the 1830s, 1840s. Mm -hmm. It must be hard to do research uh, on people from that long ago who weren't really, they weren't really prominent people. How were you able to do the research? You know, each, each one is different because you never know where the research is going to lead, what, you know, what new avenue it's, it's going to open. So each one was different. Certainly, I, uh, I covered the newspapers with all of them. Um, I covered um, uh, the Ohio State Penitentiary records are, you know, are open and, and women were back, way back, women were in the Ohio State Pen. 
at that time, and I got those records. Um, this particular one, I was able to find a uh, this manuscript that was in a library. So it's, you know, and if there's a manuscript in there, it might have a name in it or, you know, a story in it. And so then you go off on this, this area and you check that story out. And um, maybe there are s police reports still, uh, still in existence. Some, some of them I was able to get um, court reports. Um, some, you know, were just gone. You know, they always say burned up in a fire, which I guess is, you know, is possible. Uh, so, it just every single one was different, and that's what I love about it. That the the best part about doing a book like this is the research. It certainly sounds like you made a big jump from being a newspaper. Really, you were an entrepreneur in uh, establishing the West Side Leader, and then making that jump from newspaper reportage to actually writing a full-length book, and this book of episodes or chapters about these women. What did you find most difficult? The writing. <laughs> the writing is, you know, is the most difficult. The most fun, like I say, is, is the research. Uh, and a lot of times the publishers want the books like in three or four months, and it's almost impossible to do really good, solid research and write uh, a book of that length in three or four months, although I know some authors that can. I'm, I'm not one of them. <laughs> How much time did you have to put into the research? I would think from what you're talking about, going through old manuscripts and old newspaper reports and all that, that you were practically living in the libraries and the newspaper morgues and mm -hmm. such. Yeah, um, yeah, I did. Uh, I mean, let me think. It probably took me, I'm going to say 10 months to do the whole to do the whole book from, you know, beginning in research uh, to when I turned it in, when I finally turned it in. And you said that Wicked Women is one of just several books that you've done. Before that, you did several local history books? Well, I did two local history books. One, uh, b both of the, the first two were with Arcadia Publishing. Uh, and the first one was uh, Bath Township. Uh, and I did Bath because that's where I was uh, raised. I went to Revere High School. My son went to Revere. My sister went to Revere. Uh, and I was, uh, I grew up there and lived there until about 15, 16 years ago. And then the second one I did was Hudson. And I did Hudson because um, <coughs> my mom and my grandmother used to love antique shows. And there was a, you know, like a really class antique show, one a class A antique show in Hudson every year, a couple of them as I remember. So here were my sister and I, little kids, and she would be dragging us to these antique shows. She would let us, because Hudson is, is a lovely community, she would let us walk down to Saywell's drugstore where there was a, a fountain and uh, get, you know, ice cream or, you know, something to drink. And I just remembered as a child looking up at these beautiful houses and thinking about all the ladies in their long skirts and their, you know, their big dresses and everything. And so that's, I guess, the <laughs> why I did the Hudson book. Is, uh, now, when you were going along with your mother and your grandmother to these um, antique shows, is that where you started to get your interest in history, seeing those big houses and seeing the oh, antiques? I'm yeah, I'm sure. My, and my grandmother, um, was a, a a big one to keep family history alive and we were all born up in Michigan and um, so we would go up to Michigan every every summer and granny would point out you know things like well <coughs> that's the <coughs> that's the um, that's the place that your uh, great-grandfather uh, uh, decorated and there's a tin ceiling in there and uh, you know, she'd take us out to the cemetery and s we'd spread our blankets and have our picnic out in the cemetery. And um, uh, so I think she's the one that probably instilled it in me. Well, I'm glad to know that your grandmother was not one of the wicked women. No, but not at all. <laughs> <coughs> but you, at all. Have, you have just started a blog. Uh, tell us a little about the blog and how to find it. Well, the blog is um, darkheartedwomen.wordpress.com. 
and uh, it's kind of a continuation of the book. Although the women that are in the blog are not um, necessarily North, uh, Northeast Ohio or even Ohio, it's women from all over America that I find. Because as I was researching, I would find other women that I thought were very uh, interesting, but they weren't from Northeast Ohio, or maybe I didn't, couldn't get enough information on them to do a whole chapter. So I kept, um, I kept a file folder full of them. And um, so that's, that's what these women are. They, you know, they'll be, you know, much shorter stories. There'll be pictures if I have them and, and so on. So, so it kind of keeps me uh, researching and, and doing the thing that I love. Well, it's been a pleasure having you with us today. And I hope you've enjoyed watching this view from our kaleidoscope and that you'll check out Jane's blog. We hope you've enjoyed it today and that you'll remember our sponsor, RSVP. That stands for Retired Senior Volunteer Program, and it's part of Mature Services. It's for people 55 and older and offers many opportunities. Thank you so much for viewing today, and have a great day. Since 1971, RSVP has been matching volunteers' talents to community needs. RSVP is affiliated with the Corporation for National and Community Service, a national organization that supports service and volunteering through grant-funded projects. Volunteers organize neighborhood watch programs, tutor children, renovate homes, plant community gardens, assist victims of natural disasters, and serve their communities in many other ways. RSVP offers maximum flexibility and choice to its volunteers as it matches the personal interests and skills of Americans 55 and older with opportunities to serve their communities. If you're interested in adding more meaning to your life and improving the lives of others, please call 330-253-4597, extension 166. There's no place like home. Stay in your home with a 24-hour companion that doesn't need to be let outside, who isn't a grown adult reluctant to leave the nest, or a well-meaning neighbor who pops in every day. With Massillon Cable TV's MetAlert Personal Emergency Response System, you can stay home, have peace of mind, and your family will feel better too, knowing you have access to someone 24-7 should you need help. Keep your independence with Massillon Cable TV's MetAlert service. To learn more, call 330-833-4134. That's 833-4134. Or visit their website, MassillonCableTV.com.